So my brother has a farm and that's where I get to go hunt. And a few years ago, we bought a bunch of these Kudabak cameras and put them all over his place just so we could keep an eye on what was in there. And we've seen a lot of cool stuff. We've seen bobcats and coyotes and some really nice bucks that never show up during season. But back this summer, he was having some work done on a field and one of the young guys on a tractor uh, just completely demolished one of those cameras. So I figured this would be a good opportunity to take a look inside one of these things. Now you might be thinking, you know, what on earth is going to be very interesting about a wildlife or game camera? And that's where these Kudabak things are a little different because these actually do mesh networking. And so you can actually do a few layers deep and support a whole bunch of cameras and then they all route their images back to a base station which then uploads everything over one cellular connection. So that's kind of what I'm interested in seeing is kind of, you know, what's inside of this thing to do that mesh networking. And also just anybody that's got one of these, these uh, solar panel battery systems sometimes I think go bad. And so I'm going to get into this thing and see what kind of batteries they're using, see if there's any possibility of doing any kind of service on that. And just in general, you know, poke around inside, see what we can find. So let's, so we're going to start off with the camera itself. Uh, again, it is not usually this shape. Um, the, the programming interface here inside you open up this little panel and there's a little screen with some buttons and stuff and they have come out with some different revisions so I think this may actually be a bit of an older model compared to some of the newer ones. So they open up pretty easily just to get to the battery compartment. This is if you're not using the solar panels like we are. Uh, let me take a second and clean up some of this dirt that's been smashed inside of this thing. One second. They're using some Torx in here on the screws. All right, time for round two of cleaning dirt up. All right, got the back. A little power cable for the batteries. And we got the old positive negative, and that one's already broken, so it's probably... <laughs> I don't think I don't think we can hurt this thing. So up here it says copyright 2020 non-typical ink. <laughs> he definitely smashed up everything inside. Some of this stuff is so flexed it's actually hard to get onto the screw because they've been bent so bad. It's covered there are also screws on the front that were covered up with mud that I didn't see right off the bat. <sighs> Time to clean the table again. All right, I think we're finally going to be able to maybe get this thing out of the back. It's being held in by an SD card, which uh, got mangled in the process. All right, there we go. There's the light, and I think these do. Um, I can't remember this one. I'll have to look. It, I think, was one of the ones that did IR illumination, and that's supposed to scare animals less by using infrared LEDs instead of regular white LEDs. So I guess, uh, I don't know really what this is, some kind of big inductor almost? I'm not really sure what that's about. There's honestly, just looking this thing over, there's not a ton to it. So again, I think you've got a couple of camera module sensors up here. You've got your big LED array for the lighting. You've got your display and button interface here with your four buttons. One of them's already off. Um, underneath this, I haven't really gotten into it yet, but there's like the SD card slot um, and it looks like maybe some like a display driver underneath. On the back, you've got, mm, I'm assuming microcontroller, probably memory or something. I haven't actually looked at that chip yet. Um, down here, probably power, I'd guess, coming in. And then up here, I think, is going to be the RF module, so I have to get into that. So give me a second, let me look at this, and then I'll be back. You're going to have to cut some stuff off, because we won't be needing it anymore. No chance of hurting this one. All right, take it back. A little bit more complicated than I thought, because hiding under this thing was another microcontroller. So I found two more microcontrollers after nipping stuff off that I didn't know were there. So, I don't know. So 
had a good look at this and I figured out that I've already said some stupid stuff, but uh, let's go through and correct this. So down here, uh, this big Winbond chip is SD RAM, which I'm guessing is cache for the photos, uh, maybe before they get written out to the SD card. Uh, that you can see there's kind of nothing else down here. Well, on the top of this thing where the display is on the back, that has an Atmel microprocessor, and this thing has an onboard display controller, so that's what they're using this for. It's got a little bit of memory, and I'm guessing this is handling the SD card writes, as well as managing the display, and likely all the configuration based on everything I can see. So, as I said, on the back under here, there's really not much. This is just gonna be like some power stuff because you've got the solar panel external power coming in or the batteries coming in down here. So further up, you do have the imaging sensor. I have removed the, the lens and everything because it frankly fell off. On the other side, this is not a secondary imaging sensor. Duh, this is the motion sensor, so this just an IR motion sensor. It is a PYD1598 in case you're curious. And that's what this kind of cone is, is, you know, this thing is an IR sensor. So the way lenses and stuff work with infrared are kind of weird, but um, that's what this side is. That is for the motion detection. And then you got the camera sensor on the other side. So working our way up, I think this is gonna be what I would call the main processor for the imaging and everything else. The reason I say that in a bit of a hesitation is you've got a microcontroller here that controls basically your timer settings and everything else. And then you've got another microcontroller up here and then this one in the middle. So they've got three plus these two RF uh, controllers up there. So, you know, it's a fairly distributed kind of thing they got going, but this is a Freescale Semiconductor, which is now owned by NXP. It is a MIMX RT1052. And so this is like a 600 megahertz Cortex M7 core processor, so that's pretty stout. I'm guessing it's gonna be the main thing that kinda, again, handles the imaging. It's, it's again, got a little bit of memory here next to it. And then as we move up, again, we have another microcontroller at the top with, again, a little bit of memory for it. So this is a Texas Instruments, and I think, if I remember right, this was about a 25 megahertz, so it's not the fastest thing in the world. So the markings on it are M430, I think it's actually Actually, the MS430, it's just the markings are a little different. So it's a M430F5418A, and that seems to be talking to the RF communications. The RF communications are kind of interesting. These are a couple of Texas Instrument chips. This one up here, the little one, this is a front end, so I think it's handling some of the amplification and stuff. And then this is the module that actually handles all the RF communications. So the little one, like I said, it's a Texas Instruments CC1190. And then the bigger one, as I have a capacitor fall off, um, the bigger one is a Texas Instruments CC1201. And when I was looking in the specs for this thing, one of the, uh, the interesting things about it is it runs sub gigahertz communication, but it's actually running basically a thread protocol, or it's also known as Ysun. Um, basically, that, that's the communication protocol here. So uh, kind of interesting when I was looking into this is that they are using kind of, a, again, a, a low frequency, uh, low data rate connection, but it is running on kind of a standardized communication protocol. And so that, that makes sense because these things can connect something up to like a quarter of a mile through the woods. So uh, they work better than Wi-Fi at longer ranges, but again, they don't have the fastest transmit rates and that seems to be what they're using there. And this whole thing seems to be a big module. You know, I haven't cut it off to see if this is some sort of module that you could buy, but um, whether they're make, making it themselves or, or what, I'm not sure. But that seems to be what they got going on here. Uh, there's not really much else. I mean, just your big LED array. Uh, this whole thing, they are manufacturing themselves, which they've got a couple different versions of these cameras. Uh, the ones that use what they call like a dark flash, 
which is IR illumination versus something that uses more regular LEDs. And again, the, the theory is, is that the regular LEDs kind of spook animals more. So I guess that's all that we can kind of see here. So once again, I got a bunch more dirt here. So let me uh, sweep that up and then I'll get over to the battery. All right, time for the battery. All right, so on the back, we've got Phillips holding the back cover and then some Allen keys uh, holding, I think, the panel in. Let's get the batteries out first. Here's the back panel. Surprisingly user serviceable. Look at that. Well, I never I actually made this thing. I mean, look, the back panel just screws right off. Here's our batteries. So these are nickel metal hydride, 7.2 volts, 2000 milliamp hours. What a deal. And there's a second one. I wonder if those are in parallel to where you could actually double the capacity for this thing. I'd say we better find out. So uh, this all takes Allen's. So let me see if I got an Allen key handy that I can get into that. So uh, they are indeed in parallel. So you could add two batteries in case, you know, one pack didn't get you enough battery life. But uh, also interesting, there doesn't seem to be any sort of charge controller that I can see unless it's in the panel itself, which uh, looking at it, I don't feel or see any indication that there's a, a chip in here somewhere. Now I say that, you know, I'm not 100% because those, those battery management chips can be awful small. I don't see anything either in the pack because again, you know, looking at it, there doesn't seem to be anything. I'm not an expert on the nickel metal hydride stuff, so maybe it's not really that big a deal. Uh, they are a bit more robust than the lithium ion technology. So anyway, your two battery inputs are in parallel, so you could add a second battery in case you didn't have enough capacity, but they come in and go out the 12 volt output. Otherwise, they come across a diode and into a low voltage regulator and output a 9 volt side. Uh, there's really not much else to it. Like I said, there doesn't seem to be any battery management or anything in there. So yeah, they just straight feed charge during the day into these batteries to charge them up. And then when they discharge, they just go out through a little step down regulator and into your 9 volt and then into your uh, power on your camera. That seems to be it. If you ever did need to service these, man, they do make that battery super easy to replace. So that's a big positive. Well, anyway, uh, that's going to wrap this video up. It's always interesting to see how professional commercial equipment is designed. Uh, different strategies, and like I said, I don't claim to understand all of it. But uh, if anybody is interested in seeing the high resolution pictures, leave a comment down below. I'm not going to throw them up unless people really want them because I don't know how many people are really going to be interested in this type of thing. Uh, but as always, uh, I appreciate your time. Thanks.